You drive home at night and wonder what you're gonna fix for dinner. I drive home at night and hope I did enough that everybody has dinner. With this situation with, with the virus, so many people coming forward are having to ask for help for the very first time. They had jobs yesterday. They didn't ever have to worry about food for their families. All of a sudden the restaurant or the bar or the theater where they worked was closed. 40% of the increase of people needing help are first time users of this kind of a service. We had to be prepared to help them. Life sometimes comes to us in, in a, a direction we're not expecting. And I think all of us, when we're forced with a scenario that's difficult, we can do one of two things. We can either sit still, use all of our energy and feel sorry for ourselves, or we can take that energy, we can mold it into the future, and we can move forward. An example of that kind of opportunity came for me when my children were young. I was a single mom. There wasn't a battered women's shelter in my neighborhood. There wasn't a food pantry. But I had a five-year-old and I was pregnant. We ended up homeless. We had a car. We were able to stay in that car for a short time. Having experienced that myself, I'm truly able to understand what these families go through. That experience and that time in my life helped me more almost than anything else. So given the chance that you are in a situation where you feel like life is not going your way, don't use that energy to feel sorry for yourself. Use that energy to pick yourself up and to move forward. It always will be brighter on the other side and you'll make such an impact for so very many people. And if there is a silver lining to any of this horrible year we've been through, it's to be able to watch the compassion and the collaboration that individuals, businesses, religious groups, government groups have we all come together. But what a pleasure it's been for me to see how that has really ignited compassion in so many. While we had just started understanding COVID, the earthquake was very impactful. My first thought, once the earth start, stopped shaking and I knew my husband and I were fine, my first thought was, how, how are my staff? Are they okay? They were fine. And it just helped me understand and focus that my needs, our staff needs during the earthquake was really what our arts and cultural community needed as well. They needed someone to care about them, to ask how they were doing, to be reassuring and to help mentor resilience. A silver lining moment for me was this summer when we realized that through the federal government, the National Endowment for the Arts, our state legislature and the governor, that they recognized the importance of the arts and cultural community, and they were willing to put resources and emergency funding into um, these organizations. It made such a difference, mostly just to know that we were recognized and valued as an important part of our community. The arts and museums and our cultural organizations bring us hope, they provide healing, um, they help us express ourselves. Our arts and cultural community is all about making connections and gathering and bringing people together. We were so fortunate um, that we were able to distribute $19.6 million to hundreds of organizations all across the state. I can really relate to a girl who just went for it. Um, when I was a young girl, I wanted to be a dancer. And uh, that wasn't the most normal career path in my family. And I ended up traveling over 2,000 miles to come to Utah to study dance at the University of Utah. I used my dance training uh, as a facilitator and I have been able to share my love of dance and the arts and my love of teaching in this job. I can reach so many people because of that decision. The most impactful moment for me in 2020 was 
in March where we ended the session on a Thursday night and we were celebrating the best session in the history of education. The very next morning, I had a call from Governor Herbert to appear at his office and I was in front of the press standing by his side to close schools to in-person learning. Education really is about a community. The old adage of it takes a village is true. We had bus drivers delivering meals. We had um, cooks handing out learning packets. Our teachers did not miss a beat. They leaned in and made sure learning was happening in spite of the virus that learning was still occurring for our students. So everybody was leaning in in so many different ways. And that was an amazing thing to behold. Experiences I've had early on where I've tried to tackle tough challenges as an educator, whether it was as a school counselor, as a teacher, a principal, working in a district office, I've always known that you have to reach out and build great partnerships and develop relationships. This seed was planted in me early that if you, if you want to see a change, you have to be part of the change. As a junior high student, we had a new policy come into play that girls could actually wear pants to school. I was not a person who came from a family of means, and so I worked hard and earned money for school clothes, and we excitedly went and bought corduroy bell-bottom pants, if you can envision it. And I'll never forget the first day wearing those to school, and we were called into the principal's office and told that we could not wear those pants because they were too much like jeans. So I went to the principal and even appeared before a board meeting and got that policy reversed so that we could indeed wear corduroy pants to school. So I was just a girl who decided to go for it. And that one girl is still raising her hand and trying to make a difference by speaking up and just showing up to change policy, to make a difference, to advocate for every single student in the state of Utah. In 2014, I was working for the CDC and I was deployed to a tiny community in Sierra Leone at the height of the Ebola epidemic there. Uh, I was the first CDC staff on the ground and there was a lot of community distrust in international organizations, but it was my job to work with the community to actually try to stop the spread of Ebola in that community. I did this by listening, understanding what they thought was going on their um, perspectives on the Ebola outbreak, what they thought the barriers were to controlling it, and then working within their belief sets to try to stop the spread of Ebola in the community. It's actually something that I use every day in my job in Utah, but especially during the pandemic. My goal is to make sure that individuals have good information at their fingertips so they can make the best decisions for themselves and their loved ones. Almost every day during this pandemic, I have to make the conscious decision to just go for it. Um, I have chosen to speak up, to make sure that the public knows exactly what's going on, that they have the science and the facts um, at their fingertips. And this is despite it sometimes making people really uncomfortable or frustrated or even angry with me personally by speaking up. The, Planned protests at my house were widely publicized. And after that, I had such an outpouring of support from Utah residents, neighbors, strangers, and even people outside of our state. The number of the letters of support were just so humbling and inspiring. I mean, individuals took the time to write me notes expressing their gratitude and, and encouraging me to keep moving forward. And it made me realize how much good there is in the world. We can all work together to spread more positive energy uh, throughout our communities. It's not okay to remain silent in the face of opposition, and it is better to speak up and be engaged in the conversation. Um, that's a role I think we can all take in our lives. Um, and it's certainly been something that I've had to every day make the decision to, to do and go for it. Twenty twenty may very well have, have been the teacher that I never knew I needed. The past year just upended so many of our usual ways of doing business that we just found ourselves without a playbook and we were blazing new trails. All of us had to draw on life's lessons and 
universal truths to make progress. One lesson that I learned really early on in my career was that all successful efforts are rooted in communication. With the world seemingly shifting under our feet and every week being different from the last, uh, we became far more intentional as an organization about how we communicate and the level of vulnerability that we display when we are in the midst of communication. 2020 really gave urgency to this work by revealing things about our community that are frankly uncomfortable and that don't square up with the narrative that we want to believe about ourselves. But the fact that our community has widely accepted a call to action on this front is absolutely a silver lining. Seven years ago, I was weighing a decision over whether to continue practicing law full time or to take on a senior role at the Governor's Office of Economic Development. And ultimately, my heart really guided me into this field. Doing so was a big departure from where I thought my life and my career were taking me. Uh, but that decision to go for it has impacted my life in such a positive way over the last seven years, especially so during this past year. I have been extremely gratified to be involved in our response to the economic consequences of the pandemic and to be in a position where I hope that I can help advance opportunity even more broadly in a post-COVID world. The decision to pursue law school was my just a girl who decided to go for it moment. That choice required me to leave a stable job, which was terrifying since I had a mortgage and responsibilities. I was turning 30, which meant I was going to be older than most students who attended law school right after college. And I learned that I was going to be one of six women of color in my graduating class of 113. Law school was a deeply transformative experience. I learned so much about myself in terms of my capacity to push past internalized doubt and my fear of failure, as well as an overwhelming sense of imposter syndrome. I had to learn how to quiet the noise that would often rise up attempting to rob me of my peace, making me feel like I should quit, pack up and go home, or worse, that I didn't belong. When I look back and I consider this past year, there were so many moments where the task seemed daunting and overwhelming, and I just had to practice what I learned during my academic journey. I had to pause, pray, push past the valley, and plan on how to move ahead. When the governor declared a state of emergency on March 6, we knew that systematically vulnerable communities would be uniquely affected, but we wanted to understand how. So we conducted a survey to highlight key barriers that families were experiencing. And this was the first time that our division in partnership with our two statewide commissions wrote a report that highlighted the gaps in services and the disparate impact on multicultural communities. After the tragic death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and sadly several others, um, we had to pause and mourn and then ask ourselves, what do we do with this? And this opened the door to engage state leaders in honest, painful, and healing conversations about racism and systemic oppression so that we could start to move beyond words and really commit to action. So yes, this past year was deeply impactful. It humbled me, it grew me, it tested me emotionally, it strengthened me spiritually, it gave me hope, and I experienced immense gratitude because I get to work every day with people whose heart is to help, to heal, to empower, and to serve the families in Utah. businesses here in our state make up uh, nearly 98% of businesses um, throughout the state. And they're, they're a huge part of our economy. So they're, they're critical, whether it's along the, the Wasatch Front or out in the rural areas of the state. It's so important that uh, we're able to keep those small businesses in operation and, and help them wherever we can. Our small business owners, um, we're very concerned. I, none of us knew what this meant and what it was going to mean for them going forward. And I do remember, you know, those small business owners calling at, us up sort of in panic mode, like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Where do we go? How do we get access to these programs? And um, we were able to just provide that guidance and direction for them up front. Um, help alleviate some of their concerns going forward. We were one of the top in the nation in terms of SBA district offices across the country um, for payroll penetration, meaning 
the highest percentage of eligible payroll through the PPP program uh, during that first round of funding. Uh, so it was it was pretty incredible that we were able to keep so many small businesses in operation. The time that I really decided to go for it was when I applied for this position. I had nearly 28 years of experience coming into this position, but it was all related to communications and outreach and partnerships. I didn't know anything about the SBA, I'll be honest with you. I didn't have a financial background. Stepping into the position, I knew it was gonna be a steep learning curve. When I showed up, uh, I didn't have a deputy. He had just retired and he had been here for 25, 30 years, as had my predecessor. I'm coming in brand, brand new, not only to the position, but brand new to the agency. You know, there's just been so many aspects of this past year that you look back on and you say, although it was a challenging time, we had so much help through this process with so many partners that just stepped up. Um, people in this state really care about each other and we all wanted to um, ensure that success for, uh, you know, those small businesses out there. And as a result, we've been a state that has done very well economically through this crisis. I think the most and the major impactful moment for me in 2020 was the pandemic and all of the urgency and making sure that everybody was being safe. There was a large number of people of color that was being affected by the pandemic. That There were large numbers that were being uh, in hospitals and dying from the COVID-19. Some of the things that, that happened uh, here in Utah after the protests that happened after the George Floyd killing was that we were able to work with law enforcement, pull together uh, different community groups to talk about law enforcement and talk about uh, some initiatives going forward from, for this legislative session and to put some bills in place. And working with the legislators in this particular instance uh, was very helpful. I think the silver linings were coming together as law enforcement and the community working together uh, with the legislators and making sure that we were looking at all different areas of, of bills. And from those meetings, we probably have over, and I know it's over 25 uh, different bills that will be uh, coming up during this legislative session. I'm so proud that in the year 2000, was the year that we were able here in Utah to first recognize the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. I led that effort and when I say I led that effort, I had gone to and talked to numerous senators and representatives trying to get someone to sponsor the bill. Uh, everybody kept telling me that they were extremely too busy that year to do it and I had already put off on it for a number of years and finally I just said, let's do it this time. It was a lot of work and we did get it passed. So that's why we do have the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday now in Utah instead of Human Rights Day. It's extremely important that people work together and that they communicate and talk. Uh, it's better if we can all come together and we can all sit down and talk and come to some type of final uh, resolutions on these issues.